You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present As Time Passes By by John Fryer with David Kirby Kendall, Mark Hill and Helen Fullerton. Think he'll be long? It's an impossible question. I don't know when our guests will or decide to turn up. They don't tell me. Well, actually, sometimes they do, and sometimes they even stick to it. The phone rings, I answer it, as it is my job, and they say, I'll be arriving at three. Then three arrives, and they don't. I don't take it personally. I personally don't care if they turn up or not. They've booked their room, they've paid for their room, whether they then use said room has nothing whatever to do with me. The only issue, and it is an issue, is that when others ask, is so-and-so coming today? And I then say, yes, they'll be here at three. And then they look at me as if I am then the reason that their heart's desire hasn't arrived. Between ourselves, I couldn't care less either way. You said he'd be here. That was my information. But he isn't here. I haven't seen him. Then where is he? I'm afraid I don't know. He must have been delayed. I'm sure that is the case. Otherwise he'd be here. And who could possibly argue with the logic of that? He's quite famous, you know. Uh, so was Mussolini in his day. Who? Uh, before your time. I don't watch Italian films. And neither do I, now you come to mention it. He's been on TV. Mussolini? No, Edward Carr. I believe so. And he's been on the cover of lots of magazines. I know this is the case, but I play along. Has he? Oh, yes. In fact, he was up for an award recently in London. Isn't that where they usually have those sort of things? He was in a big hotel with bright lights and canopies and music and even a red carpet. It was for a TV series that he'd been in. Oh? Which one? Severed Heads. Was he one of the heads? I'm being flippant. I know I am, but I can't help it. Miss French, as I call her, although she frequently invites me to use her first name. Call me Sally. But I don't. It's quite deliberate on my part. Our relationship, which is not a relationship, which has never been a relationship, at least as far as I am concerned, is purely based on the fact that I just happen to be a fixture of this reception at the Regency Hotel. This is not the posh one in the capital, by the way, but the other one the less well-known one. In truth, the hotel has its heart in the right place, which is in the safe, in the manager's office, under lock and key. As the manager asks on a regular basis, in his usual caring manner, Have you been paid, yes or no? Well... And the Borg is still blocked in room 205? A regular guest, a larger lady, affectionately known as the Dumper. I believe so. Oh, how we've all suffered for that woman's bowels. All right, give it another week, and then call the plumber. That money grab it. Which I do. When the plumber arrives, he investigates the scene of the crime. He has, once again, needed a stiff drink to face the horror of 205. Oh, what the hell have you been serving in the restaurant? And then to his poor put-upon assistant, uh, a man that had never previously had my sympathy. <sighs> Get a plunger. The, the big one. Fortunately, I am spared the investigation into the horrors of the hotel's waterworks. But not always. Frequently, maintenance is arranged by the hotel management. A curious expression that suggests that those in authority either A, deem to talk to us, or at least keep us somewhat informed, or B, even introduce themselves. Managements, from my experience, are just people who, as time goes by, you come into contact with. They usually adopt an air of, Don't you know who I'd like to think I am? In truth, of course, most enterprises work from the lowest rung of the ladder because the least desirable, horrible and humiliating tasks are usually handed down to them. It has been said, usually under the breath, mind you, never openly, the harder you work, the less you learn. Therefore, by definition, the easier you have it, the more will find its way into your bank account. Personally, I wouldn't know. My bank account isn't entirely empty. Not entirely. There are some gaping areas. 
But I was talking about the division of work, with those in the immediate firing line often having to defend the indefensible positions of others, who are almost always off doing something far more interesting at the time. Well, I probably wouldn't implement the new online booking service until you're absolutely sure that it works. It might be an idea to iron out any of the bugs with a trial period. Don't be such a wimp. It works fine. Just get on with it. I'll be in my office. I don't want to be disturbed. Personally, I always thought he was. I made this reservation online. What do you mean you've never heard of the sunlit booking agency in Scarborough? And then there are times when the receptionists find themselves in the hot seat. For no other reason than they foolishly turned up. Have you seen this? I've seen what? The state of it. It's everywhere. Uh, what is? That's it. I've had it. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is he does up there, but every time he turns up, there is mess all over the carpet. Why does he have to splash it all over? Wasn't that an advertising campaign? If he gets it over the carpet again, I will not be responsible for my actions. And then who will be? He said, you called him in. I was instructed to. The manager said... The manager! To... So, if the manager told you to put your hand in a big fire, would you do it? Not as you put it. But you'd do it to me, wouldn't you? The idea of sticking the housekeeper's hand, or, or even all of him, into a blazing fire had, if I was honest, some appeal. But then who would be left to clear up all of the ash afterwards? Of course, once again, as duty demands, I play dumb. I only imagine the flames. You'd be happy to drop me in it. The dirtiest, filthiest, most disgusting jobs. Oh, give them to the housekeeper. That's the attitude, isn't it? Well, not quite. The thing is that I... I know you're all in this together. I can tell when the cards are against me. I can sense which way the wind is blowing. Which was convenient, as due to the aroma coming from 205 that day, we all knew which way the wind was blowing. Or wasn't blowing, in this case. However, it wasn't long before the plumber returned to the reception, hot and sweaty, and covered in... in... I'm not going to take it anymore. Go and pick on someone your own size. He was, in fact, twice the size of me. If he mentions that carpet, just one more time. What? I'll leave. I'll never come back. Until tomorrow, which is exactly what happened. The lady stayed, the toilet blocked up, the plumber was called, and both the housekeeper and the plumber told me how they could no longer work with the other, and then continued to do so. Then at Christmas, I noticed the plumber with his arm around the housekeeper's neck, in a good way. Pure gold. <laughs> He's pure gold. During all of these moments, of course, I am required to be the picture of neutrality. The one person for whom personal opinions are never uttered. At least, publicly. What do you mean you haven't found my mobile phone? This is the bugbear of all receptionists. I know I left it in the room. They all know this. I took it out to reserve tickets for the theatre last night, so I know I had it then. I have checked with both the restaurant and the theatre, so there is absolutely nowhere else it can be. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, nothing has been handed in to me. Someone must have it. Yes, you ignorant idiot. Which is what I think. Uh, but of course I don't say it. <laughs> but I think it. Have you asked the cleaners? It never takes long to get to the point of accusing the cleaners. Because you know what they're like. They're all very nice. But they're not from around here. Actually, neither am I, but I don't say anything. Some of them are from a very long way away. You mean the other side of the river? To be truthful, it's South America, but I don't let on. They're not like us. In this, she is correct. I've always found them to be hard-working, decent and honest. So she is, in fact, spot on. They are not like us. But once again, I let it go. So, my phone, where is it? This is usually the point when despair sets in. Someone who, A, was foolish enough to lose their own property, then B, foolish enough to admit to it, then C, foolish enough to accuse those who know nothing of it, and lastly, D, then seems to think that I can wave a magic wand and it will appear. When faced with foolishness on that scale, there is no answer. Uh, leave me your number and I'll ask the housekeeper. 
The housekeeper will, of course, have no more idea than me, but as was once said, foolish is as foolish inevitably presents itself, and it has been presented that way to me many times. However, once again, I digress. I was starting to tell you about my visitor. Well, visitor is really not the word. The real word is an inconvenient pain in the neck. It started, I thought at the time, although I've had plenty of reasons to reconsider this view since, rather innocently. Saying that, Genghis Khan probably started off innocently enough, and look how he turned out. Now, my good man, I, I found this delightful and, one may say, pretty damsel in distress, waiting just outside the main doors to this rather charming hotel. Would you have any objections to her waiting here, inside, just for a few minutes while we converse? It is raining outside. What could I say? He was an actor from some soap on television who, presumably, once made enough money to buy a big house and had given up the small screen to do worthy projects on the stage. A touring production had come to town, and he, his name was Edward Carr, was spending a week at the local theatre and with us. Oh, and he'd also done a couple of films playing, I thought at the time, a severed head. I've watched everything you've been in. I thought you were wonderful. Oh, my dear lady, how right you are. <laughs> I keep my mouth firmly closed. Do you intend to do any more TV in the future? Well, one can never afford to say never, dear lady, but treading the boards will always be my first love. He's a terrible ham. His acting style off the stage is no better than when he is on it. When I was at the National, Sir Roger said to me, Eddie, you define our age. And when you look around at the cheap, short-term, in-it-for-themselves attitude that prevails today, I'd have to agree with Sir Roger. Whoever Sir Roger turns out to be. Can I have your autograph? Oh, dear lady, certainly you may. He's been waiting for this. It's the accumulation of the celeb-slash-hopelessly-devoted fan relationship. It also means that after the signing, he can be shot of her. Which, at the time, I considered to be a little sad. But only at the time. In fact, you may have a photograph as well. Taking out a reproduction that is at least 20 years old, he searches for a pen. A dear chap, may one trouble you for a writing implement? I hand him what was, at the time, my finest fountain pen. To Sally, with love, Edward. Shall I add some kisses? Oh, I don't want to be ever any trouble. It will be a joy. Uh, one, two, three. <laughs> now, I really must go and prepare for this evening's performance. Tally-ho! And with that, he is gone. It is only afterwards I remember that he still has my pen. Isn't he marvellous? He's very nice. Nice is safe and doesn't commit me to anything, although pen thief is what I'm actually thinking. I'm watching him tonight. Oh, do you have a ticket? I bought it already, but I only like centre seats. I have to have certain seats. Oh? Of course, I'm trying to sound interested, but the trials and tribulations of where someone puts their backside is of so little fascination that I'm now struggling just to keep focus. Yes, centre of the front row... Or maybe a few either side. Which didn't strike me as a huge range at all. But once again, I let it go. Well, you could always try other seats. Oh, I don't think so. My eyesight isn't very good, I'm afraid. Do you have any glasses? I don't like wearing them. They rub at the top of my nose. Glasses often do. But it would allow you to sit in other parts of the auditorium. I haven't got the money. But you go to the theatre. Oh, I love the theatre. I go quite frequently. Give the theatre a miss, and you'll be able to save some money to be able to buy yourself some glasses. As long as I get the centre seat, I won't need any glasses. And I suppose there was a logic in that. Sort of. As long as I can see the stage, that is all that matters. When the lights go down, I only have to focus on the traffic of the stage. That's from Romeo and Juliet. Actually, I did know that one. We studied it at school. Or did I see it on the television? I can't remember. And is that what is on at the moment? Surely Mr Carr was not playing Romeo, 
Friar Lawrence, perhaps, but not a young, feisty lover. No, it's a drama called The Sunflower Man. Isn't that a comedy? Is it? Didn't it make you laugh? Some people were laughing, but I always seem to miss the joke. Maybe it's time to get some glasses after all. I've told you I don't have the money for that. I think it's stopped raining now. Oh, right. And with that, off she went.